Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, and we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge, and let's talk about some true crime. Okay, I have to say something. Oh. Yep, just real quick. Do we feel that Carla Homolka peaked in the 90s? Just lo- looks-wise, not actions-wise, oh, guys. Okay. I'm like, sorry. What kind of peaked are we talking about yeah, here? I can see I'm how like... that would be confusing. <laughs> My yeah, bad. I don't know if I feel like she peaked ever, but Mm-mm. actions-wise, yes, yes, yes. Uh, looks-wise, 100%. She just looks gross now. Not great. You know, for being the Ken and Barbie, you know, kind of thing, it was like, oh, so attractive. So, I mean, not anymore. Mm. Mm-mm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I was honestly kind of shocked to see her now yeah, versus then. But I'm sure a lot of that has to do with the fact that she wants to completely disassociate herself from... Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to jump ahead. Just, I just, I've just, that had to come out of me. Okay. Well, I hate everything about her. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So should we, let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. All right. We have some trigger warnings, guys, right off the top. Oh my gosh. Am I an idiot or what? What? what I almost mean? forgot to tell them about the Patreon and stuff. Oh God. Yeah, you are an idiot. Jeez. Before you do that though, I would like to talk about, there is a song. I cannot for the life of me think of who sings it, but it's from the nineties and it's called, I hate everything about you. Oh yeah. And I think that that is my anthem for Carla Homolka. That's a good one. Was the band name Cold? <laughs> right? It should be. Because they... Oh, Three Days Grace. Three Days Grace, yes, <gasps> And yes. they're Canadian. Perfect. Oh. Maybe they did write it about Carla. I'm trying to find it now, and now I don't think I'm going to be able to. Anyway, I can't remember the name of it, or the who sings it, but he's like, Because I hate everything about you. Oh, and it's like, you're talking about a different song. different song. Yes. Okay. Because I was like, I just said it, Tori. No, no. Three days grace. (laughs) This one's different. He's like, the core or the verses are funny too, because he's like, he's talking about how he's like, um, I hate, I hate the mountains and I hate the countryside too. And he's like, I hate your mother. I hate your sister. And he's like, and I hate everything about you. He's like, oh, wow. I get sick when I'm around. I. It's so funny. It's everything is how much he hates her. Oh, yep. Everything. I was thinking, you know, the other one. Nope. Nope. All right. There well, are multiple there are. hate songs. Yeah. There's more than I thought there were. Yes. <laughs> oh Absolutely. my gosh. But either one, it, it, put it, put e- any one of those. The in, other one works. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, this is a two-parter, dudes. Yeah. So if you want access to part two, like right away, you can totally do that if you join the Patreon. Plus, everything's ad free over there. Yeah. And you get access to part two right away at $3 a month. You don't have to do higher than that. And everything's ad free at $3 a month. Right. But if you want to jump up there, you get other bonus episodes like our murder mixtape once a week, which is a whole new case, and our doc jams on Fridays, which are episode by episode series coverage. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's That's a lot of stuff going on over there. Yeah. And we figured out that it's something like 500 extra episodes that you could get. Yeah. Because we've been doing this a long time. We really, really have. Um, but if that's not enough for you either, we do have a live weekly show on Spotify Green Room, And it is on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central. Yep. And that is a place where you can talk to us specifically if you want to. You can request to speak. We can have conversations. We can talk so much. If that doesn't work for you, you can just leave comments. Either either way, we would be happy to have you. So, so fun. Yes. Okay, now. Okay, now. 
All right. So now we've got some trigger warnings. We've oh. got, I mean, there's so many. If you can think of a trigger warning, it's in here pretty much. Mm-hmm. Sexual assault, rape, abusive relationship, violence, drugging, kidnapping, murder, dismemberment, pedophilia. We also want to thank, and there's there are a lot of people who requested this, but thank nice. you so much to Tara Nolan, Nicole Rains, Jessica Shelton, Laura Watson, Mandy Smith, Coley Rains, Marina Schober, Megan Klatt, Grace, Aaron Martin, and Angela Gibbons for requesting it. And uh, Reagan Klatt. What did I say? You said Megan. Oh, I'm sorry. Reagan. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I forgive you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I hope Reagan does too. And thank you to Mark for writing it up. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. It, does it? I know. That's what I was thinking. Do we even need a... Let's just do it. Let's do it. Okay. In January of 1993, Carla Homolka went to the police after her husband, Paul Bernardo. I was going to call him Paul Bernardino, but that's not, that's not his name. Paul Bernardo viciously beat her with a flashlight. She wanted to press charges and told them that her husband was the Scarborough rapist and responsible for two unsolved murders that they had been struggling with. After DNA proved that to be true, Carla got a plea deal. Get ready, guys. Mm, And agreed to testify against Paul. Mm -hmm. After all the evidence was finally discovered, though, the battered wife victim story that Carla had told police was shattered. But with the plea deal signed, she only served 12 years in prison, outraging the victim's families and the entire nation of Canada and everyone else in the entire world after this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Forever and ever. Amen. Yes. Yeah. This, we should rename the episode to All Your Shits Out the Window. Yes. Forever. And ever and ever. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Get ready. We're going to start with Paul Bernardo. (sighs) Yeah. We're going to talk about his early life, him meeting Carla. When you dive into Paul's past and read what his friends and family said about him, one sentiment always seems to shine through. He was, quote, beautiful. Personally, I don't find him attractive. You know what? I don't either. I will say that seeing different photos of him, I'm like, oh, okay, that one's better. Yeah, yeah. Some photos. The um, him in action, I I guess, you know, you would say like in some of the VHS tapes, I'm just like, Ew. his yeah. mannerisms, I just, they're yucky. Yeah. I don't know. He comes across as quite douchey. Yeah. He, oh, yeah. He looks like the epitome of douchebag. Mm -hmm. but I guess especially for the time, I mean, you know, he had the blonde hair, he had the blue eyes. Um, He was considered very, very attractive to pretty much everybody that knew him. And this would kind of come into play later when he would be interviewed in the Scarborough Rapist investigation a few times. Another thing that kept him off the police's radar was that he was a good talker. He was eloquent. He was articulate. That coupled with his attractiveness helped keep him basically hidden in plain sight. So Paul was born in August of 1964. When he was first born, he had a huge black mark that covered the left side of his face. When his mother, Marilyn, first saw him, she actually screamed out loud out of shock. Hmm. That's concerning. Yeah. It's like as a child and you're like, hey, mom. She's like, oh, God, what is what is that on your face? You're like, oh, my God. I mean, I guess at least he wasn't old enough to understand what was happening, but still, this is a story that we even know about, so. I know, geez. It ended up being a blood clot that resolved and faded away within six weeks, so it wasn't around for long. When he was younger, Paul's father, Kenneth, sexually abused his sister. Thanks a lot, Kenneth. Right. Like, it's just so sad to see what this this kind of behavior can do, you know? like mm, Yeah, absolutely. In 1975, Kenneth was charged with child molestation after he was caught, quote, fondling a girl. Kenneth was also known as a peeping Tom. And knowing what Kenneth was doing, Marilyn pretty much withdrew from the family slash public life. She knew that Kenneth had and was still molesting their daughter. She chose to move into the family's base- basement and separate herself from the situation. So she now is Mm -hmm. allowing her husband to molest. And I'm not saying that it's her fault because Kenneth needs to not do that, obviously. But the only person that she cares about removing from that situation is herself. Yeah. Okay, cool. Love Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So let's put that in a parenting book. 
<laughs> in the book Lethal Marriage, author Nick Prawn best describes how everyone looked at and felt about Paul when he was a child. Quote, he was always happy, a young boy who smiled a lot. And he was so cute with his dimpled good looks and sweet smiles that many of the mothers just wanted to pinch him on the cheek whenever they saw him. He was the perfect child they all wanted. Polite, well-mannered, doing well in school, so sweet in his Boy Scout uniform. When Paul was 16, Marilyn told him that Kenneth wasn't his real father. After Paul's brother and sister were born, Marilyn had begun to have an affair outside of the marriage and had gotten pregnant. Kenneth knew of the affair and agreed to be listed as Paul's biological father on his birth certificate. Marilyn told Paul this after a heated argument she had with Kenneth saying, quote, you're a bastard and you better get used to it. Okay. Oh my God. That is like not okay. (laughs) Mother of the year. Like your heated argument is with Kenneth. Yeah. Why are you taking it out on your children? Exactly. Again, I, we have talked about this till we're blue in the face, but you can't make excuses for somebody's behavior later in life, but you see where this is all going. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's just definitely not healthy circumstances to live up to grow up in like right you know and it's going to come out somewhere and unfortunately he didn't get any help for it right yeah and you know it was kind of an in the heat of the moment thing to say which again it's like Marilyn if you're trying to hurt Kenneth you you fucked up there Mm -hmm. like it's like when uh what is that movie um oh god now I'm gonna fuck it up um describe it. He's like trying to learn the not jokes. He's like, it's over here. Not, but what is this? I'm thinking Borat. Borat. Yes. Okay. Where it's like, he's trying to learn, you know, the like, how to do that. The like, not, but he, he kept fucking it up. It's like, no, that's not how it works. Mm -hmm. You're not making the joke on the right person. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. I just don't like, what are you doing, Marilyn? But the result of this was Paul being completely repulsed and angry at his mother. He started to call her a slob and a whore daily. Yeah. So all it did was um, turn her son against her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. And now we're seeing maybe some hatred of females. Right. And you also- know, the mommy issues. Yeah. If Paul knew what Kenneth was doing to his sister- And nobody is confronting that or talking about it or saying, hey, not cool. Let's leave so we don't have to put her in this situation anymore. What is that saying to him? Yeah. Yeah. This is just a lot of really fucked upness. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. While there was a lot of turmoil at home, Paul was very popular at school and among his friends. They called him a silver-tongued devil who was very popular with the girls. I hate that. He did have a bit of his father in him, though, and Paul also became a peeping Tom throughout the neighborhood. Perfect. When he was caught, though, he didn't receive any type of punishment, not even a slap on the wrist. And there we go. And there we go. It's like, Paul. Boys will be boys. Yeah, boys will be boys. From there, Paul began to collect newspaper and magazine ads that featured prepubescent girls and women in their underwear. He escalated from there to BDSM porn and from there to urination and defecation. Now, two consenting adults whatever you want to do. But we know that Paul Bernardo does not go on to do anything with a a consenting adult. So we're not kink shaming here. It's just there's things that he got into and he went in a very, very unhealthy, violent way with it. Absolutely. While he was growing up, Paul lived across the street from the Smyrnies. That's kind of a fun last name. I like it. The Smyrny brothers, Van, Alex, and Steve. As they grew up together, the brothers became sort of henchmen for Paul. Their father owned a Greek restaurant and the (laughs) brother... The brothers. You sound like a (laughs) three-year-old. Yeah, that's how Jesse says. My brother pushed me down. Mm -hmm. Um, Their father owned a Greek restaurant and the brothers traded free food for stolen gas and the ability to illegally fish on private property. Hmm. As Paul got older, he was able to get out of the house and begin working. He took jobs at local restaurants, and his ultimate goal was just to make lots and lots of money. Like, no shit, Paul. Having come of age in the 80s, Paul was very fond of the greed is good lifestyle that was glorified in the film Wall Street. In his early 20s, he aspired to be a finance guy living the yuppie lifestyle. I'm thinking American Psycho too, right? Oh, yeah, for Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, definitely a lot closer to that, huh? 
I think so. Yeah. In 1986, Paul was attending the University of Toronto Scarborough and dating a young woman named Jennifer who was still in high school. Jennifer said that Paul would always get sexually aggressive around 11 or midnight, and when he drank, he got extremely violent. She said that almost every time they had sex, Paul would demand anal sex, something she wanted nothing to do with. The Smyrnies brothers said that Paul told them, quote, oh God, he's just so gross. Mm. Anal sex is the ultimate way to show domination over a woman and the only way to make a woman love you. Um, Strong disagree, bro. I was going to say, I'm going to call bullshit on that one. Um, And the thing is, (laughs) I feel like, again, it's the consent Right. That's what we're talking about. Because if you, if you're into anal sex, go for it, girl. Like sure. I mean, whoever, you know what I mean? I call everyone girl. So that's what I mean. But yeah. whoever is into it, do you, I'm happy for you, but you gotta, we gotta want to be in on it. Exactly. Yeah. Demanding is not okay. No demanding. Yeah, exactly. And if you want somebody to love you, I mean, you know, different strokes for different folks. Starbucks is my way sure. Everybody's got their love language. Some people, it's not anal sex. And if it's not, then maybe you should try something better. Yeah. Definitely not forcing it. Like also domination over a, I mean, oof, you know, Mm -mm. there's just, what the fuck, Paul? Mm -hmm. He also began to sexually abuse Jennifer by inserting things into her vagina just to see how far he could get it in like wine bottles. What the fuck is wrong with this person? Mm. Over time, Paul would begin to reveal these things to his friend group, particularly the, Sm- now I'm forgetting how to say it, Smyrnies. Mm-hmm. Okay, the Smyrnies brothers. And while the brothers were okay with petty theft, illegal fishing, etc., when Paul talked about violence towards and raping women, they all said that was too much. I mean, you got to draw a line somewhere, right? Sure you do. Did we tell anybody? Smyrnies? That don't, it doesn't appear to be that way, no. Yeah. In 1987, Paul's yuppie dreams began to come true when he got hired at Price Waterhouse, an accounting firm. And right around this time, Paul and Van Smyrnies, Smyrnies, whatever, were out one night just looking for girls in Toronto. I, I can't. They had heard that the local Howard Johnson was a great place to find girls. Are we just, we're chilling at the Hojo? Apparently. I mean, Speaking I guess. To the Hojos. I guess here it was the Sonic parking lot back in the day. So I can't just, judge, you know? Yeah. It just depends on, on where you are and what you got to make the most. I, I don't, I don't even know. Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But it was there in that Hojo's that Paul would meet then 17 year old Carla Hamulka. And the thing is, <laughs> <laughs> and another thing, right. What I have gathered from this is that everybody was like, oh, what a nice young man. And I'm like, he's 29 years. I mean, he wasn't, but he was a lot older than she was. Yeah. And she's 17. And nobody thinks that's like, eh, could we not? Nope. I mean, it's pretty close. It's closer than I'm sure he... Let's see. She was born in 70. He's born in 64. So if she's 17, math, 23? Yeah. Six years older? 23 and 17 would not fly with me, you know, for my kids. You know what I mean? Like, no. Call her when she's fucking 18, you dirtbag. Right. And even then, it's a little... Because the thing is, a lot of times what happens is when somebody is much older than you, and I think six years at that age... is a big difference. It's a big difference. And then there's a power imbalance there. Yep. Yeah. And that's what Paul gets off on. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. It's not like he just found the love of his life. I feel like he had an ulterior motive because we know who Paul Bernardo is. He wants to dominate women. Yeah. So, yeah. And in this case, a girl. I think that's something that, you guys, this might be a nine hour episode, but like, I think that's something as we get through these two episodes, I would really love to hear like your thoughts on and, you know, listeners' thoughts on like, well, we might have to take it to the green room, honestly. Well, that's true. Yeah, because, you know, she is very young when she meets him. There's just a lot there. I hate Carla Homolka, but you know what I mean? Like you said, there is a a power imbalance that... Well, and I think there's some grooming involved, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not giving her a pass. No. But yeah, I mean, I can... Again, it's like there's no excuse, but it's kind of an explanation. Okay, here's how we got here. Yeah. Okay. So... Let's talk about Carla Homolka. Me. You know, 
Not thrilled about it, but we're going to do it. So she was born in May of 1970 in a small city in Ontario named St. Catharines. Her father, Karel, was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia and worked as a traveling salesman. And her mother, Dorothy, stayed home with the children. After Carlo was born, the family welcomed two other girls, Tammy and Lori. And Carell was an abusive drunk who would often get in arguments with his wife and Carla would sit comforting her siblings, trying to keep them safe and calm. When she was young, Carla loved to draw and had a love for animals. And she had a measured IQ of 132, which is said to indicate, quote, superior intelligence. In school, Carla was regarded as a good student by her teachers and they could see that she was unfortunately generally pretty bossy with her friends. She enjoyed reading Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys novels, but as she got older, she began to show dark tendencies with her friends. One friend, Renya Hill, I think so, I hope so, said that when she was younger, she was friends with Carla and all the girls spent a lot of time together. And one day, Carla was at Renya's house playing and decided that she wanted to see if she could get Renya's pet hamster, George, to fly. Uh Uh-oh. I don't love this. Carla constructed a rudimentary parachute out of a pillowcase and strapped it to George and she threw him off of the second story and obviously George did not fly. The pillowcase collapsed in, collapsed in on itself and George plummeted to the ground and it took two weeks for George to die after the incident. That is horrible. It's awful. It's totally awful. Why did you think that he would fly? Why? And for her to have loved animals as much as it was said that she loved animals, like, yeah. What were you thinking there? And so, yes, I had a hamster at one point. I actually had a couple of hamsters, but this one in particular, Mr. Jangles, mean as hell. Mm-hmm. We had a dog at the time, Jacques, little French poodle, very cute. Yes. I opened the cage. Mr. Jangles comes crawling up to get to the opening because he like just hang there sometimes. And then sometimes if I was brave enough without a glove, I would pick him up because <laughs> he was a biter. So Jacques comes over and smells him. And I was like, well, this is adorable. Mr. Jangles bites him on the nose. <laughs> Jacques slings, you know, he's just shaking his head because, yeah. of course, he's like, get this Something thing off is of on me. me. Yeah. Mr. Jenkins goes, he goes flying across the room. He lived for two years after that. I mean, he was, he was fine. He w- didn't fall from a second story right. window yeah, or anything, just, right? And it bonked. It was a complete accident. I mean, he landed perfectly, like, right on the carpet, just like right there. Yeah. And I never had, I never thought, oh, wow, he could fly. <laughs> exactly. Hey, now that that's happened, let's drop him off the roof. What else, see what else he can do. Yeah. Like, no. Oh, fuck, Carla. I know. Oh, I know. So anyway, um, after George passed, Renya buried him. And she said that after it happened, Carla showed absolutely no remorse and looked like she enjoyed the whole thing. And a few weeks after Renya buried George, Carla made her dig up the hamster corpse so she could mess with it. What is... Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Renya also told another story that showed Carla's cruelty towards people. One day they went to a local park and played baseball with the other neighborhood children. And Carla quickly lost interest in the game and turned her attention to a disabled girl who was there with her brother. She was watching the children play baseball as Carla approached her. The girl's arms were half the length of a typical child's arm. So her hands were only really stretched out as far as her chest. Carla began to mock her and said that she had, see- quote, this is a direct quote, seal arms. And that she belonged in a zoo. What the fuck? The girl obviously begins to cry, which only emboldened Carla. And other kids had begun to gather around and laugh at the little girl and her brother. Carla began to taunt them even more, getting other children to join in with her. And soon they all began to slap their palms together and imitate a sound that a seal would make. And Renya said that after seeing this and Carla's reaction, Carla was very pleased with herself. That's, if I found out my kid did some shit like that, I Mm -hmm. don't know what I would do to punish them. Like, I don't know a punishment that is worthy. I know. Of treating somebody else that way. It's so cruel. It's so cruel. I have, I don't even, I don't know. I mean, but that's something that like, that's concerning. If you've, of course, you know, I mean, that's just, I don't know. I guess kids make fun of other kids, but. I don't know. That's just, I would be really concerned about that, especially when you've got now the animal incident. Mm-hmm. And there's something going on here. Oh, absolutely. And she's doing it in front of other people and children. Yes. 
When Carla got a little older and got into high school, Carla became more of a nonconformist compared to her sisters and other children in their small town. She would try to do things just to get a rise out of people or her friends. She started wearing black clothes. She dyed her hair all kinds of different colors. She began to cut small circles into her skin and fill it with nail polish. Oh, ouch. I've never heard of that specific. No. With nail polish. No. Carla's high school boyfriend, Doug, said that when Carla didn't get her way, she would always threaten to kill herself until she did. Many people said that if you look into her past, there are clear signs that she had borderline personality disorder, which went untreated all her life. But because of her, quote, love of animals, Mm -hmm. stretch, Carla began to work at a local pet store just before she graduated high school. And it was at this pet store that she met and befriended a woman named Debbie. Debbie said that Carla was a perfect employee and she even wanted to work with animals later and attended veterinary school. And while she was there, Carla was such an outstanding employee that they invited her and Debbie to attend a pet expo on behalf of the store. And this expo was being held at a Hojo in Toronto. The Hojos. Hojos. Mm. As Carla and Debbie were eating dinner in the hotel restaurant, they were approached by Paul and Van Smyrny's. I can't get can't out of this fucking name. <laughs> I'm probably saying it. I mean, there's a couple different ways you could say it, I'm sure. But come on, Smurry. <laughs> so good. <laughs> the, the two men asked if they could join the women as they ate. According to both Paul and Carla, it was love at first sight. Oh, my God. They just couldn't keep their hands off of each other. Within an hour, they were in Debbie and Carla's hotel room. As Van and Debbie awkwardly sat there, Paul and Carla had sex for four hours. Oh my. That's a lot. Of, um, that's a lot of sex there. And it's a lot of time to sit and be like, <laughs> you guys done yet? Or yeah, like, uh, I don't know. We can come back up there. Yeah, that's a really long time. Mm-hmm. Carla would later say that in the beginning, Paul was nice and swept her off her feet. But more importantly, he wasn't a bore. I mean, and that's fine, you know? You guys want to be adventurous, be adventurous. Right. But I I do think that, I mean, again, she's 17. Yeah. You're 23. Yeah. Yeah. And at this time, like she still lived with her family in St. Catharines. Paul lived in the Scarborough area, which was about two hours away. So Paul started to visit Carla's family home whenever he could. And Carla's family absolutely friggin' loved him. They took to calling him their weekend son. And to them, he was a handsome guy. He had a good job. He was making money and he could take care of their daughter. And of course, like Paul can put on this facade. So he fooled everybody. Mm -hmm. When Paul went to the family home, he would wait for everyone to go to sleep for the night and then sneak into Carla's room and they would have sex, of course. After a while, though, the quote vanilla sex wasn't enough for Paul. And he suggested that they spice it up. Okay, that's fine. How did they do that? Yeah, what are some ways you might spice it up? I'm. I'm recalling the Friends episode where Ross is trying to spice it up with Carol, you know? We and could, Phoebe. Yeah, Phoebe is like, mm-hmm. you know, all these things, you know, you could tie each other up. You could eat food off each other. You could eat chocolate off each other. You could, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. What Paul wanted to do was sneak outside to peep into Carla's younger sister, Tammy's window. It was 12. Mm-mm. 12. And Carla was like, oh my God, babe, that's a great idea. You should totally do that if that's what you want. I fully support this decision. Yeah, I cannot even imagine if, first of all, like, I don't know, you really got to think somebody's going to go along with you to bring something like that up. Yeah. You know, like that could go a very different way if she's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I'm telling my parents, you need to get the fuck out of my house. But yeah, you really got to know your audience there. Yeah, but she was just like, okay, great. Like, oh my God. Mm-hmm. While all of this is going on and Paul is driving back and forth to visit Carla, he was still in a relationship with Jennifer. That ended on the night that he graduated from college, though. He had begun to accuse Jennifer of cheating on him, which wasn't true. She ignored the accusations and gave him a graduation gift, a nice sweater that she had bought for him, which just flat angered him. And he went out to his car in the parking lot and started doing donuts. So Jennifer, like, (laughs) a sweater? (laughs) (laughs) And then he just had to get into his car and just start popping, just, I don't know if you pop donuts. What do you you call that? Yeah. I guess just doing them. You do the donuts. (laughs) I don't don't know what you (laughs) 
<laughs> he popped a lot of donuts that he night. He popped so many donuts that night. He's just like, I mean, angered him to no end, the sweater. I just love, because, okay, I am making a sweeping generalization, and I'm sorry for it because I know it's not every guy, but there is a certain age of guy that cannot hold in their anger. And what do they do? They pop donuts. Mm-hmm. They Punch a they wall. pop a hole in the wall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just so, it's interesting to hear like what you do with all of this anger that you have. And you're like, I've got to just do some donuts right now. I feel like I need to see the sweater. What about the sweater <laughs> was just incensed him? Well, he does. Okay. I think it's a known fact that maroon angers people. Oh. So pro- it was probably a maroon sweater. Had to have been a maroon like, sweater. Yeah. What? I mean, Paul was a stylish guy. Mm. Mm-hmm. You want him to wear a fucking maroon sweater? You know what deserved donuts that didn't happen? When I was in high school and I went to Florida and I brought home a puka shell necklace for my boyfriend. <laughs> yep. That deserved donuts. Mm-hmm. I don't think a sweater deserved the donuts. <laughs> did he wear it though? Probably. Yeah, my boyfriend did when I brought him a puka necklace. You know what? He sure didn't. He did not wear that. Aww. Now that I'm thinking about it, he did not wear it. Well, he shouldn't have, but... <laughs> he didn't even... He couldn't even like... Just wear it the day you get it or something. You know what I mean? (laughs) Throw me a freaking bone here. I Mm -hmm. thought of you. Those necklaces, if you went to the beach, you were coming home with a puka shell necklace. There was no way around it. I came home with multiple puka shell necklaces. Well, sure. You got to get one for yourself, one for your boyfriend. I don't know why that was like the thing you get your boyfriend, but. Then you want an anklet too to match. Oh, shit. Got to have the anklet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So Paul's out there doing popping donuts, whatever. Jennifer comes out there and she's like, stop doing that. And he's like, okay. And then she's like, we're broken up. And he's like, fine, that's fine. But let me drive you home. And she's like, okay. So they're driving. He stops at a light. He grabs her by the hair and he hits her. He did this at every light they stopped at. He then drove to a secluded road and pulled out a knife with the intention of stabbing her. He fumbled with the knife though and dropped it in between the car seats. And once he dropped it, Jennifer escaped from the car and ran away. Good grief. This poor girl. This poor girl. So with Jennifer gone, Carla and Paul's relationship jumped to hyper BDSM levels. During one session, Paul asked Carla how she would feel about him if he was a rapist. To which she replied she thought that would be cool. Again, you got to really know your audience. Yeah. But... He did because Carla was cool with that kind of stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. and she didn't know that he already was a rapist at that point, but she was just like, I don't know. I mean, I guess that would be fine. All right. So let's back up a little bit. So before he met Carla, Paul had already began to assault young women in the Scarborough area. And as of now, or when we're talking about, there are at least 14 rapes and six attempted rapes attributed to Paul Bernardo. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we know about rape and sexual abuse is that the majority of incidents go unreported. And according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, an estimated of 63% of sexual assaults are unreported. Mm. So other sites or sources cite lower numbers, including the U.S. Bureau of Justice at 15.8% to 35%. And this is kind of based on older numbers, but sexual assaults are most likely to be reported if the offender is a stranger, which is 46% to 66% reported. And with those numbers in mind, it's really not a far leap to say or think that there are probably a number of women out there who Paul raped that never reported it for for one reason or another, right? So it's like, it could be fear of retaliation. They're ashamed, which they shouldn't be, mm-hmm. but you know, things like that happen, unfortunately. Yeah. So there are a few places online that have a timeline, and this is the most clear and concise source of the events. So May 4th, 1987, Paul committed his first rape in Scarborough against a 21-year-old woman in front of her parents' house after following her home, and the attack lasted more than half an hour. On May 14th, 1987, Paul committed a second rape. He attacked a 19-year-old woman in the backyard of her parents' house, This incident lasted over an hour. That's 10 days apart. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be his first and second. (laughs) Now, we know that he was assaulting Jennifer. Yes. During their relationship. That's so close together for it being like first time, second time. Yeah. You know? Yeah, very, very much so. July 27th, 1987, 
Paul attempted his third rape, although he beat the young woman, he abandoned the attack after she fought back. December 16th, 87, Paul committed his third rape against a 15-year-old girl, and this rape lasted about one hour. The following day, the Toronto Police Service issued a warning to women in Scarborough traveling alone at night, especially those taking buses. December 23rd, 1987, Paul committed his fourth rape. During this attack, Paul raped the 17-year-old with a knife he used to threaten his victims, and it was at this point that he began to be referred to as the Scarborough Rapist. April 18th, 1988, Paul attacked a 17-year-old, and the fifth assault, this one only, only, this one lasted 45 minutes. May 25th, 1988, Paul was nearly caught by a uniformed Metro Toronto investigator staking out a bus shelter, and the investigator noticed him hiding under a tree and pursued him on foot, but Paul escaped. May 30th, 1988, Paul committed his sixth rape, this time in Clarkson, about 25 miles southwest of Scarborough, and this attack against an 18-year-old lasted 30 minutes. October 4th, 1988, Bernardo attempted a seventh Scarborough rape. His intended victim fought him off, but he inflicted two stab wounds to her thigh and buttock, which required 12 stitches. Mm. November 16th, 1988, Paul committed a seventh rape against an 18-year-old in the backyard of her parents' house. November 17th, 88, Metro Police formed a special task force dedicated to capturing the Scarborough rapist. Can you imagine? I mean, so many of these are right in their, like, parents' front yard, backyard. Like, that's terrifying to be at home and Mm -hmm. be attacked Mm -hmm. at home. The freaking, that's a bold fucking move. (laughs) You know, a dad could come up with a shotgun at any moment. 100%. And I don't mean to laugh, but the fact that you just said freaking and then fucking did I in the same sentence <laughs> yes well i think it's warranted <laughs> just wasn't expecting you to even use the word freaking because i already said the fucking didn't i yeah you sure did the mm-hmm. freaking fucking front yard <laughs> jeez but you're absolutely right i mean that is a gutsy bold move and i think that that just goes to show how emboldened he was because he mm-hmm. really didn't think that he was ever going to get caught for any of these things no and unfortunately it seemed like he wouldn't have if carla I and mean, you know a little yeah. bit of a spoiler alert but we talked about it in the description if she hadn't gone to the police yeah. what, how long would it have taken you know exactly all right so the list is not over December 27th, 1988, an alerted neighbor chased Paul off after he had begun his attempted eighth rape. June 20th, 1989, Paul attempted to rape another young woman. She fought against him and her screams alerted neighbors. Paul fled with scratches on his face. August 15th, 1989, Paul committed his eighth rape against a 22-year-old woman. He had stalked her the previous night from outside the window of her apartment and waited for her to arrive home. This particularly vicious attack lasted two hours. November 21st, 1989, Paul committed his ninth rape against a 15-year-old whom he saw at a bus shelter, and this attack lasted 45 minutes. December 22nd, 1989, Paul committed his 10th rape against a 19-year-old. This attack occurred in a stairwell of an underground parking lot and lasted 30 minutes. Two days later, he and Carla got engaged. Oh, I know. Sweet. <laughs> May 26th, 1990, Paul committed his 11th rape. This rape lasted over an hour. However, his 19-year-old victim's vivid recollection of her attacker permitted police to make a computer composite photograph, which was released two days later by police and published in Toronto and area newspapers. So one of the attacks resulted in the victim being able to provide the police with a description. They then used that description to come up with a a composite sketch. And who do you think that sketch looked like? Give you one guess. Mm. Looks like Paul Bernardo. Oh, okay, Paul. I know. Shocking, right? Yeah, shocking. So the police had received two tips about Paul during the investigation as well. And one was from a bank teller who had dealt with him. And the other was from Tina Smyrny's. 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 The wife of one of the Smyrny's brothers and Paul's childhood friends. So during their investigation, the police questioned Paul twice. When Paul talked to them, he went in wearing a suit. He was like generally put together in regards to his appearance. And this disarmed the police to an extent. But the way he spoke did as well. He was confident, but he was a little nervous. And they said it would have been a red flag if he wasn't nervous since talking to the police is nerve wracking for a lot of people. 
They asked Paul if he minded if they took a DNA sample and he volunteered it without questions. They took hair, blood, and saliva samples to test against the specimens that were found on one of the victim's clothing. And you would think they had their, they had their man, right? Yep. Boom. Tested. Done. Yep. Uh, no, that didn't happen. So DNA testing was in its infancy at this time in the center, or and at the time, the Center for Forensic Sciences in Toronto only had one qualified scientist and one technician to t- test the samples. And they weren't just testing samples in the Scarborough rapist case. They were testing samples from numerous cases throughout Ontario. They had an estimated 50,000 samples to test for the various cases across the province of Ontario. So it's, unfortunately, it just, they didn't have the resources yeah. Yeah. to be able to test it. And I kind of feel like that's why Paul, one of the reasons why he was so just like open to giving his DNA because that was one of the things that the investigators said. They were like, if this is our guy, then why would he have given us his DNA like that? We Mm -hmm. could have had to get a warrant to get it, but he didn't make us do that. He's just like, yeah, sure. Of course, whatever you need. Like, so we just thought, well, it can't be him. him. Yeah, Yeah. Why would he do that? But I think he probably was thinking like, the fuck is DNA? Like, yeah. Is DNA is that for anything? Yeah. Like, exactly. What are they going to do with that? Like, he didn't know how it was going to work, I don't think. Right. Because it was so new. Yeah. Because, I mean, even to this day, like, DNA is so huge, right? And there are still people that are like, wait, you know, like, perpetrators. Wait, is DNA in my spit? Like, mm hmm Sure. Yeah, like, they they didn't get a blood sample, so. Exactly. Yeah, they think it's, like, Mm -hmm. only blood or whatever, so. I mean, I can see how he was just like, yeah, whatever, sure, fine, take my DNA, what are you going to do with it? (laughs) Or we've seen perpetrators in um, interrogation videos when left alone try to rub their fingerprints off just by rubbing them on their pants. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, all over the board. Yep. Mm -hmm. So guys, we're going to pull a dick move here. Yeah. Real dick move. This is the end of episode one. Mm -hmm. But if you stay tuned in episode two, we're going to dive into the deaths of Tammy Homolka, Leslie Mahaffey, and Kristen French. And the abduction of Jane Doe and the trial. So lots more coming up. Lots more. My goodness, yes. So if you're a patron, you can go ahead and start listening to that now. And if not, no worries. We'll catch you next week. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, we have got some Hey Girl Thanks for some of our brand newest patrons. And I said brand newest. That's a word. Yeah, and I meant it. I'm glad you meant it. <laughs> hey, girl, thanks to Christina, Pippa McMurdy, Erin Schreng, Shiloh Bickle, JM, we think this may be Jenny, Amber Walworth, Molly Witt, Alice Galtry. Ooh, I'm glad I got this one. Um, Sarah, definitely not a witch. We're glad you're not a witch. Yeah. Abigail Robinson, Jamie Furman, Emma. MC, Megan Borchart, Wilco Keller, Melissa Ashurst, Riard Evans, and Chloe Eckland. We are so grateful for you guys. Thank you for hanging out with us. Yes, we love you. We love you. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening, and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at KillerQueensPodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. Mr. Jangles crawled up to the opening. Oh my God, it's a spider! Ah! Hang on, I'm sorry. Where the fuck did it go? Oh, God, I see it. Okay. Darla, I'm gonna die. Okay, smash it. Okay. No! Ah! Oh, my God. Ouch. My apologies. Um, You did it. Sure did. Good job. Jesus Christ, I don't, that was the scariest thing.
<laughs> I just really saw something out of the corner of my scary. eye uh, running across the wall. Oh! Uh-huh. And then um, when I screamed, it flew off of the wall. Oh, my God. Yep. And landed on another part of the wall behind the lamp. Then I moved to the lamp, and then it dropped to the floor, and then I couldn't find it. <sighs> but I found it, and I killed it. It was not very big, but it was, um, it was nonetheless scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm terrified about it. <sighs> Do not like that. Oh, I really literally went into fight or flight mode. Uh, yeah. Literally thought I was going to die. Yeah, I thought you were going to die too. I was like, well, nice knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is where it ends. <laughs> yep. I feel bad for my neighbors. <laughs> I feel bad <laughs> for my roommate. <laughs> I feel bad for these damn dogs. They're probably like, the fuck is going on in there? 